So welcome everybody and welcome to this VET Team AMR equine launch event hosted by RCVS Knowledge. For those of you who don't know, RCVS Knowledge is the charity partner of the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons and their mission is to advance the quality of vet care for the benefits of animals, the public and society. I'm Dr. Sue Patterson, I'm Junior Vice President of the Royal College. At my day job is I'm a veterinary dermatologist and I'm pleased to say that I do treat scabby horses as well as scabby dogs and cats. Um, before I briefly introduce our speakers, I just want to go through a few housekeeping points if I may. Um, first of all, would you please make sure you keep yourselves on mute and please keep your cameras off. The session is being recorded. We um, recognize that not everybody can make it through other commitments, so that will be available as a recording afterwards. So please pass that on to your, your colleagues if they'd like to take advantage of that. We would love to get you to put questions in uh, and you, you can do that throughout the whole of the course of the presentation this evening. Please put those into the Q&A box for us. We have already had some questions submitted to us prior to the event. Um, so I'll try and combine all those almost thematically as we go through. And we promise you that any questions that aren't answers, we will follow up for you um, over the course of the next few days and weeks. There's also a link in the chat to the um, RCVS Knowledge Newsletter. And if you'd like to, we'd very much appreciate it if you want to sign up for that and get newsletters from Knowledge. And of course, at the end of the meeting, there will be some feedback forms. And again, if you're able to fill those in, just take a few minutes of your time, we'd really appreciate that. That allows us to improve what we actually do and gives us ideas for the future. And finally, that's the final finally, before I introduce our speakers, we'd love you to share your attendance on social media. And if you do, please use the hashtag Hashtag vet team AMR. And so to our speakers, I am delighted that we have five fantastic speakers tonight in the form of Tim Mayer, April Lawson, Bruce Bladen, Nathan Slovis, and Gillian Perkins. And we have got a really packed, fast-moving program. And because we have got such a packed program, what I'm not going to do is read out the CVs of all our speakers at the beginning of their presentations. I'm just going to introduce them by name, but magically their CVs will appear in the chat box, I'm hoping, before their presentation. So do take the opportunity to have a look at those just so you can get an indication of the CVs and the caliber, I'm delighted to say, of our speakers tonight. So let's get going and I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker this evening, who is Tim Mayer. And Tim's going to do an introduction to VET Team AMR. Tim, over to you. Thank you very much, Sue. Uh, good evening, everybody. So my name's Tim Mayer. I am um, clinical lead for this project. So Vet Team AMR is an initiative from the uh, Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons Knowledge, RCVS Knowledge, uh, as Sue has described. Uh, and it's basically here to champion and support vets, veterinary practices and veterinary teams in uh, their responsible use of antimicrobials. Uh, this project is part sponsored by the VMD. So I'm going to just do a very, very quick overview of the, of the uh, Vet Team AMR equine project. It's very similar um, to the Farm Vet Champions project that some people here will be uh, familiar with. Uh, and we're launching companion animal and equine projects. The equine is launched tonight and the companion animal ones will be launched in a couple of weeks time. So there's two main parts to this. Project one is a learning platform. Uh, this is on RCVS Knowledge's Learn, which is their uh, learning platform, and it contains peer-reviewed webinars, podcasts, PDFs, and other information and quizzes about antimicrobial use and antimicrobial resistance of relevance to equine practice. And then the second part is the antibiotics uh, or antimicrobials audit tool which allows practices and vet teams to audit and benchmark their antimicrobial use. So this is an overview of uh, some of the material on the learning platform. Uh, and you'll see there's information here about uh, antimicrobials and antimicrobial resistance, communication behavior, diagnostics, surgical prophylaxis and wounds, infection control, canine and feline uh, information and equine. 
Uh, and in terms of the equine information, uh, this is building at the moment, but you will find this uh, already on the site. Some of these are, uh, are already in place and some of them are work in progress and there'll be more information put there in due course. So we have information on antimicrobial resistance in equine practice, uh, orthopedic infections, treatment of bacterial placentitis and endometritis, antimicrobial use in foals, antibiotics in strangles, low respiratory tract infections, uh, and antimicrobial use in skin disease. But as I say, there will be more information and more uh, uh, projects being put on that site in due course. So the antimicro anti antibiotic or antimicrobial audit tool, uh, this is being hosted by Amplitude Clinical Outcomes. This is a human healthcare software system um, the same system that's being used uh, for the canine cruciate registry, if anyone's familiar with that. And there are two main parts to this. The firstly, there's the client reported outcomes. So these basically home in and target on individual horses and individual owners uh, and their experiences and using uh, why antimicrobials may or may not be a, a prescribed and how they've got on with treating their animal with those uh, antimicrobials. So briefly, the owner needs to register the horse, his, the, his or her horse onto the system. Uh, and then we'll fill in a questionnaire uh, before a consultation or before appointment. The vet will then fill in a questionnaire after the appointment, uh, and that will trigger then an email to the owner after the consultation. And the owner then fills a post-consultation questionnaire uh, three and 10 days after the consultation to get information about the, the animal and its response to treatment. Uh, and then the vet will have a post-consultation questionnaire at four days. So that's the client, rep client reported outcomes part. Then the bulk data downloads, this is basically a, a means for, for practices to monitor and audit uh, total antimicrobial use from the practice. And this can be done in several ways. It relies on what's called a product classification dictionary. This is basically a list of all the antimicrobials used in equine practice their different formulations and trade names and so on. Uh, and then from the practice management system, there's in various different ways that we can access this data. Um, so, yeah, so individual practices can monitor their antimicrobial use and also then benchmark it against other practices, uh, anonymized data from other practices. So the first thing you need to do is register your practice. Um, and this should be done by what a so-called responsible user, that may be the practice owner or clinical director or practice manager, someone who's over, going to oversee and responsible for, for running this system and be able to monitor all the data going into the system. Uh, and that responsible user then will allow veterinary surgeons with the practice to register as well. So this is the form, the, the electronic form that needs to be filled out by the practice. Um, and this is an overview of how this works. So after the practice has uh, registered, um, when a client phones in, and for example, if the practice thinks, well, well, let's audit the use of antimicrobials in coughing horses, and we'll concentrate on that for a period of a couple of months. So if a client phones in and has, I've got a coughing horse, can someone come and look at it? Uh, they can then be asked whether they want to enroll onto this system um, and register their horse. And then once they've registered, then the pre-consultation questionnaire will be sent to the owner. They will then uh, provide information. Then the consultation will take place. Uh, and then the vet will do the, the uh, questionnaire and the owner will do a, a post-consultation questionnaire. Uh, and then finally, there'll be a, a treatment review questionnaire some 10 days or so after the consultation. And all that data is, is collected by Amplitude uh, and is available for the practice then to review. So when registering a new page patient, um, basically after if the owner agrees to participate in the system, this then triggers an email sent to the owner who then registers the patient. So this is the, the, the form that the practice will fill out, just detailing the owner's name, um, patient name, and animal ID. And that's basically how the, the horse is registered on their own practice management system. So that then uh, triggers an email going to the owner, and we'll just very briefly run through this. This is what the owner will get. Basically, then the owner agrees, well, give some information about their horse, so it's male, female, date of birth. If, it's, if they don't know, then generally they'll say 1st of January, the year of birth, the surname, the horse's name, 
Uh, there'll be a drop down list with the practice. This is a test system, so we're going to call this practice Tim. Uh, and then they click on oh, it's an equine pathway, or if they've got small animals, companion animals as well, they may want to, to uh, give information on their small animals also. Then they have to verify that they're not a robot. Uh, and then they've asked for a secret question for security. Uh, and then this is just to review um, their update the details that they're giving, the email address, the mobile number, postcode. And then they have a consent form, electronic consent form. Basically, they agree to participate in the, in the audit tool. So then that so that means the uh, the client has registered. They then have to give some information about the individual horse. So we're causing the, this horse is called Eddie Forbes. Um, so that's as the animal ID, which is how it's registered on the practice management system. Uh, if it's a male, is it gelded? Is it vaccinated? Um, some information about its exercise status, uh, how much work it's in, the type of work it will be doing. It's a little bit of information about the diet. Uh, and then how long the horse has been the owner's possession, where it came from, whether it's insured. And then about the consultation itself. So this may be um, you already have a date for the consultation or it's unknown as yet. Uh, and then they ask about whether the horse, when the horse was last seen and whether it received antibiotics at the last visitation by a vet. And then the main com presenting complaint. So why they called the vet. And there's a, a list of common reasons why owners may cause vet. And, the, and there's a, also an option for other if it's not covered by that list. The duration of, of the problem uh, and whether there's any other problems that they would like the vet to look at at the time of the visit. And then they ask, well, what are you hoping the vet's gonna do for you today? Well, hopefully it's gonna diagnose the cause. Uh, and then that's it. So the, the horse is now registered as well. So going back to the overview now, so we've done the uh, enrollment, we've done the registration, the pre-consultation questionnaire, then it comes to the consultation itself. So this is where the vet will have to fill in a, a questionnaire. So this is the work list for the individual vet, and you'll see that the horse Eddie Forbes is there because it's been registered under this vet's name. Um, and this is then looking at the clinical record for Eddie Forbes. Now, um, things that are written in red means they are yet to be done. Things that are in black means they've already been done, or in gray means they will be done, need to be done in the future. So you can see in red here that the vet's initial assessment needs to be done. So this is the vet's assessment. There's the date of the uh, consultation. Uh, again, just checking it's a male horse and it's gelded. Um, there should be a, a drop down list of here of vets, but because this is a test system, um, that's not uh, operating at the moment, but normally you would have your name there that you click on. And then it asks you about the consultation itself. And did you take samples? So samples for analysis, for example, you might take a tracheal wash for cytology. You may take a swab for culture and sensitivity and so on. Um, a weight, and that can be estimated or exact if, you, uh, if you've got access to a weigh bridge. And then about antibiotics prescribed. So were antibi antibiotics prescribed? Yes or no. If they were, was it single or more than one antimicrobial? So in this case, Eddie's been prescribed trimodizing oral powder. Uh, it's been, they're being in sachets and it's giving one sachet twice a day for five days. And then there's justification or ask for why, the reason why the vet felt that antimicrobials were justified in this case. And again, there's a list of potential reasons or you can write other and explain what that is. So then going back to this is the clinical record then. So we can see now that the bits that are written in black, so the prescription, the owner pre-consultation questionnaire and the vet's initial assessment are all done. Uh, and in gray, the things that are gonna happen will be needed in the future. So that will be the owner's post-consultation questionnaire, um, which normally takes place three days after the consultation and the owner's treatment review questionnaire, which would normally be given out at 10 days. This is um, the task list, and this is for the whole practice. So this just basically shows what tasks are need uh, in, in the system and need to be uh, completed uh, for the whole practice. And then the 
Amplitude gives the ability for reports to be uh, generated. And these reports can basically review any of the information, any of the data that's been collected uh, for the, the horses that are part of the study. Uh, and so there's a whole range of different reports that are available uh, and can be used for auditing and uh, benchmarking processes. And you can compare your own um, results with anonymized data from other similar practices. So that was a very quick whistle stop tour through the system. Um, if you're interested, then please register um, and you can register on the RCVS Knowledge uh, website, uh, Vet Team AMR Audit. Uh, and the learning platform is now available. So please go and look and give us your feedback. There will be a lot more information, a lot more um, presentations and webinars going on to that uh, learning platform in due course, but some are already up and ready. So we'd be very pleased to hear uh, your opinion and your views on the audit tool itself. Thanks very much. Thank you, Tim. And of course, this is all completely free, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yes, absolutely. So thank you, Tim. A start start okay. the ball rolling. Um, I'm not going to take any questions or anything at this stage. Just to remind you that we've got that link there in the chat for the monthly newsletter. And we are going to get some CVs appearing there in just a second as well, I'm absolutely sure. So I'm going to introduce our next speaker now, who's April Lawson. And April is going to give us an update on antimicrobial resistance in equine bacteriology submissions in the UK. So thank you, April. Over to you. Hi, hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Thank you very much for the introduction. So um, to start with, um, I'd like to go through a bit more on antimicrobial resistance. And antimicrobial resistance is one of the top 10 global health threats and is requiring a One Health approach. So to cover a bit more of a background, the um, antimicrobial resistance can be innate, which means that the bacteria may naturally resist the activity of a particular antimicrobial or it may be acquired in which the resistance is developed through mutations or horizontal gene transfer. The emergence and spread of antimicrobial resistance can vary greatly between bacterial pathogens. So certain bacteria may have remained highly susceptible to first line antimicrobials, whereas others readily acquire resistant phenotypes or even genes against critical, critically important antimicrobials. And an even more concerning picture is when bacteria may manifest broad intrinsic resistance, which uh, include examples of Enterococcus or Pseudomonas, and when they then acquire additional resistance too. So the only way to monitor this changing picture is to ensure effective surveillance of antimicrobial resistance. The VARS report um, provides details of UK veterinary antibiotic resistance and sales surveillance, which the VMD collates resistance data from clinical submissions of culture and sensitivity profiling to government labs. However, reporting is predominantly of resistance in farm animal species. Equine clinicians um, more readily uh, utilize private and commercial labs. And the value of this data in monitoring antimicrobial um, resistance patterns in horses has recently been demonstrated by Kaiser Isgren. And that paper has been um, put onto the slide here. So this also highlights how ongoing surveillance is now needed to understand the emerging and changing resistance patterns. So hopefully this is where EVSNET, and I say hopefully because this is part of my PhD, where uh, this can help, and that um, EVSNET is the Equine Veterinary Surveillance Network. It is following on from the success of the small animal equivalent SAVSNET, and it aims to harness electronic health data, uh, which should be hopefully rapidly an actionable research and surveillance in the UK equine population. It uses two arms and two types of data sets. One is the laboratory arm collecting data from the labs, and the other is the vet arm of the project collecting electronic patient records from the equine practices harnessed from the practice management systems. So in this talk, we're just going to focus on the methodology of the and results from the EVSNET lab arm, and of that is subset of the data that's collected, which is the bacterial culture and sus susceptibility of the clinical samples. So data is collected from the kindly participating labs, so very many thanks to those labs that have uh, submitted data to this network. It's supplied in two electronic formats, and we receive data from all labs on the unique submission number, 
the report to date, the animal species, the identification of the bacteria, as well as the susceptibility results for each of the antimicrobial tested. Unfortunately, there is a lack of completeness for some of the signalment details, and that's because we can only really report on the uh, details that are provided to the lab, so the completeness of the submission form by the vet as well. But the postcode of the submitting vet practice is recorded by all but one of the labs, and the sample site and um, or type is also recorded by most laboratories, except maybe two um, that are contributing. It's worth noting that contributing labs do utilize a range of techniques, and also the interpretation of these results are using different guidelines, including mainly the CLSI and the UCAS. So the tested antimicrobial agents are also grouped to class level um, as well, and that's because the labs use differing antimicrobial panels. So I want to go through some of the benefits of using antimicrobial surveillance data, and that is in detecting emerging antimicrobial threats, resistance threats, and monitoring the susceptibility of the bacterial isolates. And this may help to guide antimicrobial use policies and local empirical therapy. And I just wanted to go through some examples using FSNET data on how uh, this may be useful. So the first example is looking at antimicrobial dashboards, so monitoring the overall picture of antimicrobial resistance. And in this example, it's just using a small sample of the data to show you what the resistance dashboard may look like, utilising lab data from both SAFSNET and EVSNET. So this is a screen capture, and hopefully this will play through. OK, yeah, perfect. Um, so you can see that you can filter according to the animal species as well as according to the bacterial genus. And you can also do that to species level two. And then to the sample site or type, which on here we then just kick the top, which is urine. And then also even to the geographic location. And you can filter all of these in different combinations, which the rest of this will then go through. So this is useful for monitoring trends and patterns of the susceptibility, as well as helping to potentially guide antimicrobial use and local empirical therapy. So the next, next example is really born out of a query we had regarding penicillin resistance in strep equi equi samples due to a paper reporting this in their data. So this would be concerning as it's a treatment of choice for cases which may require antimicrobial treatment for this type of bacterial infection, for example, those causing respiratory distress due to strangles or in cases where there may be persistent strangles carrier status. So we're able to look at this data and identify that we had noted this and we hadn't, but we can continue to closely monitor this situation. Another example I put here is for E. coli. And in this example, there's monitoring of the susceptibility to aminoglycosides, which it would be important considering it's uh, an antimicrobial we commonly use for gram-negative infections, as well as highlighting that the example of fluoroquinolones is a protected antimicrobial. We should avoid using this, but we can also, with this type of data, um, highlight how we can monitor the antimicrobial uh, resistance to these types of uh, critical antibiotics too. So many clinicians will use antimicrobial treatment guidelines, such as the Breathe Protect Me, and the screenshot on the slide here is of that. And this type of data could help inform some of the guidelines that are also in place. And the final example is uh, utilizing the escape pathogens. So this is a group of bacteria that are frequently, mul frequently multi-drug resistant and can be associated with hospital acquired infections and are an increasing concern in the vet setting. And actually in humans, this is one of the leading causes of fatal hospital acquired infections. So using this surveillance data, we can monitor the prevalence of antimicrobial resistance in equine escape pathogens, and this will help to monitor emerging threats of resistance with these. The heat map on this slide outlines the prevalence of antimicrobial resistance for both multi-drug resistance as well as resistance to one or two classes. And um, you can see here that multi-drug resistance can be determined for Pseudomonas or Enterococcus, and that's because um, of the high intrinsic resistance that these antibiotics have. And therefore, in the lab, um, the panels for antimicrobial susceptibility is quite restricted. So actually, there was insufficient antimicrobial classes tested, and on average, only two were tested anyway. For acquired resistance. 
So it's worth, also worth noting here that there are some low numbers for some pathogens, and that may be because there's insufficient speciation for these. But overall, this type of data helps to identify that acquired antimicrobial resistance is prevalent amongst the escape pathogens in horses. This may limit treatment options, but it also highlights the important ongoing surveillance to identify some of these emerging threats. And then lastly, limitations of this data, and we did how we would like to improve the reliability and consistency of the data reported. So many labs feed into this type of surveillance network, and at present there are no universally standardised lab methods in place. But the European Network for Optimization of Veterinary Antimicrobial Treatment, specifically part of Working Group 1, are working to develop a common resource for veterinary diagnostic laboratories. So it's worth, if you're interested in this, there's the um, website on the slide here, but it's something to watch out for and it's a really important initiative. So then considering the data quality and quantity, we need to um, ensure that this is considered because from a quantity perspective, participating into the surveillance network is super important. This will make the resource more valuable as well as more reflective of the UK horse population. And then from a quality perspective, I would already discuss some of the missing data that is seen in some of this, some of these submissions, and we can only uh, report on the information that is received. So in conclusion, hopefully I've demonstrated that antimicrobial um, surveillance of the diagnostic laboratory submissions is very important, and there's many benefits to this. And hopefully I've highlighted that there are, although there are potential barriers, there's ways in which we can address them to make this data more reliable and consistent and uh, even more a valuable resource. So thank you very much for your time. I will sh stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much, April. And do remember everybody, if you have any questions, please feel free to put those in the Q&A session and we'll come to those at the end. I'm not gonna take questions between the sessions. So thank you, April. Let's move on to our next speaker. And our next speaker is talking about antimicrobial use in equine practice, and I'm delighted that we have Bruce Bladen, who's going to share his experiences with us. So Bruce, the stage is yours. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so just look at antibiotic usage in equine practice. And, and, and the reason this is important is, is in 2019, 1.27 million human people died attributable to antimicrobial resistance. That's not died with antibiotic resistance. They died because of antibiotic resistance. So we are already at levels where comparable to the amount of people dying of COVID. And if you think it's got nothing to do with us, just look at some of the statements coming from the World Health Organization. We suggest that antimicrobials classified as highest priority, critically important for human medicine should not be used for the treatment of food producing animals with a clinically diagnosed infectious disease. So there's nothing here about, um, you know, you've got culture and sensitivity or anything like that. That is, no, you're not using them full stop. And their conclusion, the undesirable consequences associated with such a restriction appear to be relatively small or non-existent. So I think it's clear that if we don't act, we're going to lose the right to prescribe antimicrobials in relatively short order. We've mentioned already that farm animal antibiotic usage is, is really ahead of ours, published um, every year, you know, their monitoring is ahead of ours, published um, every year by the VARS report, the Veterinary Antimicrobial Resistance and Sales Surveillance um, Survey. And this is how much antibiotics farm animal uh, sector uses, and they set themselves a target of 50 milligrams per kilogram and then achieve that very easily. Um, in 2016, they've given themselves a target of doing that by, by 2018. We thought it must be possible to do something similar um, in the equine sector, um, despite the use of sort of non-licensed antibiotics and such like. So we work with um, our practice management system, which is the Eclipse um, practice management, and Brian Witt was very helpful in developing this antibiotic usage report. What it does is it gives us the option to classify any product as an antibiotic. And so here we've got a knee pressage bandage. That is obviously not an antibiotic. And so the antibiotic class is blank. 
Here we have amicacin, um, amica vet, which is amicacin, and, and you can see we've classified it as an amino glycoside. It's, it's, it's group of antibiotic. And we then have to classify them um, as milligrams of active ingredient per sales unit. So here's a fairly easy one, depocillin, procaine penicillin, um, is 300 milligrams per mil. And if we inject a horse with, with 20 mils of, of depocillin, we would record in the system depocillin 20. So it's 300 milligrams per sales unit. This is where it often became more confusing was with the potentiated sulfonamides. So if you used a tube of trimodiazine paste, um, that's 15,000 milligrams per tube. And obviously then there were situations when these were sold by the box um, and such like. So, so, so it became, became more, more, more difficult. And there were so, several errors in there we had to, to weed out over, over, the, over time. Now, I'm sure we, we all know that the, the World Health Organization classifies antibiotics as either important, uh, so these are ones that nobody's ever really heard of, Highly important um, includes um, things like penicillin, tetracycline, uh, first and second generation cephalosporin. Some of the antibiotics we'll use quite a bit. Critically important includes the aminoglycosides um, that we'd use a bit. And then the highest priority critically important antibiotics these are the ones that, that there's often the discussion about. Third, fourth, fifth generation cephalosporins, that's ceftiafur, cefquinome macrolides, polymixones, and of course, the, the, the quinolone, so en enrofloxacin, marbofloxacin would be the two that we'd, we'd use most commonly. And, and, and the query gave us the option to further distribute the antibiotic groups, and we chose to use the WHO classification. There is an EMA, a European classification, but we felt that the WHO one is, is the more widely recognized with, with, the, with their use of the highest priority, critically important um, sector. And then what we developed was a, was a denominator. And so, so that is the number of horses that are treated. And that's all horses treated, whether they're treated um, for, for, with antibiotics or whether they're vaccinated or have their teeth rasped uh, or whatever. And we used the average weight of the horses which were treated with antibiotics. Um, now, this obviously depended on, on whether we, we had weights for them. Um, all the hospitalized cases, of course, had a recorded weight. If a practice had less than 10 horses recorded with, with, with a measured weight, then we just used a generic um, 500 kilos. We've got data from 14 practices. I would like to thank them all. There's a lot of work that goes into generating these, these sort of queries and, and sending the data through. This is the, the, the practices. Thank you, everyone. And we've gone up to, in 2019 was our, was our peak, where we had 107,977 horses. And I remember that the beta survey estimates that there's 72,000, um, 726,000 horses in the UK. So we, I, I think we can be fairly confident that we're over 10% of the horses in the UK are involved in this. And this is it, this is the data, this is how much we're using from 14 practices up to 108,000 horses. And you can see we have seen a little bit of a reduction and we are below that magic 50 milligrams per kilogram line but only a little bit. Um, this is, is, is by comparison in, in, a, in an agricultural brown, you can see the farm animal usage and you can see they've seen a much more profound drop in, in antibiotic usage and, and are at a, at, a, at a lower level now. This is the highest priority, critically important antimicrobials, obviously much lower levels are used can, can, other than 2012, we're always less than one milligram. Um, per kilogram, and there does seem to have been a drop in the in the last um, last three years, which is, is 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 relatively encouraging. Now I mentioned this that we were using the average weight of horses when the weight was recorded, the hospitalised cases, and obviously the 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 issue here is how many foals you admit to the hospital. That um, the, the, a double blow for you really admitting a foal is is a it doesn't um, doesn't doesn't give you a very big denominator because it doesn't weigh very much. And second, you're bound to use gallons and gallons of antibiotics on the, on the damn thing as well. Um, so, so they're always a bit of a blow when you, when you get one of these coming in. But nevertheless, the average uh, weight of horses over this time is 510 kilos, over these 100,000 100, horses. So it really is um, you know, fairly consistent that 500 kilos is, is, is what we're looking for. 
so so we can, I think we can say with some confidence that 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 the average horse weighs about 500 kilos. And, and, and of note here is is that the VARS report is using 400 kilos, which is based on a, on a rather obscure reference, which they didn't actually interpret correctly anyway. And, and I think with that, that is wrong. There's just no way that 400 kilos is the average weight of a horse, uh, certainly in the UK. Now, what is variable though is the milligrams. So if you put a horse on trimodiazine, you're probably assuming you're giving it twice a day, uh, you're going to be using about 30 grams of antimicrobial um, per day. If you give it oxytetracycline, you're only using eight grams a day. And if you give it safety fuel, you're, you're using 2.2 grams a day. So, so looking at the milligrams per kilogram is not really necessarily the best way. In fact, it's an incentive to be using um, more reserved antibiotics. And equine usage is dominated by, by use of the potentiated sulfonamides. Obviously, they're widely available and, and you can give them orally and they're not very expensive. So, so that's, those, those are why. And in dark blue, you can see here is all the, uh, the, the potentiated sulfonamide use. Pale blue is all the others, and then in red is the highest priority, critically important. You can see a, a very small part of what we use in total. There are other ways to look at this data, and, and, and one of them is the defined daily dose uh, vet per animal per year. So that's the number of days in a year which the average animal will receive a dose of antibiotics. We use the, the, the doses just off the beaver drugs, App, and again, we we're able to work out roughly how many doses had been administered to compared to how many horses. Um, and, and this is the unit that VARS, the VARS survey recommends for use in small animals. And there is the data. And you can see less impressive reduction here, probably because the, the, most of the reduction we've seen in milligrams use is, is, is less use of potentiated sulfonamides over the years. And we're staying at about uh, the, the 1.5 um, days per year that the average horse is on to, on antibiotics. Now it's slightly strange that they they they, they chose this metric um, to use because if you look at humans, um, the defined daily dose is is the number of people per one thousand taking antibiotics per day, which 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 obviously is 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 a sort of similar similar but different calculation. There's the data in 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 the UK. Um, they're in Netherlands. The Netherlands is recognized as one of the best countries in the world for controlling its antimicrobial use. And Greece is recognized as being the worst country in the world for it. The, 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 the excessive use of antibiotics seems to be very much cholera, um, um, surrounds the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean countries all use a lot of antibiotics, but Greece is the worst in the world. And that is equine use at 3.3 milligram, 3.3, uh, um, uh, what am I talking, 3.3 per thousand, 3.3 horses per thousand horses is on antibiotics on any one day. So I query the, the, the point of the DDD vet per animal per year. As I say, it's 2.74 times less than the DDD um, per 1,000. And, and it leaves me thinking really as, as just somebody come up with this because it's less directly comparable to published human data, because um, certainly when you look at this uh, here, you, you would say this, this metric doesn't suit the argument that it's veterinary use of antibiotics, which is the, 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 the primary problem. But in conclusion, equine practice in the UK, we're using just under 50 milligrams per kilogram of antibiotics, or an average horse is receiving one and a half days of antibiotics per year, or 3.3 of 1,000 horses are on antibiotics on any given day. So thank you, I hope that's interesting and it gives us perhaps some benchmarks to, to work towards in, in future years and, and trying to reduce the use. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Another really, well, nearly excellent presentation. So do remember, say questions, please, in that Q&A box, if you'd like to ask some of our panelists later. And we'll go on to our next presentation then, which is from Nathan. Nathan Slovis is going to talk about antimicrobial use and antimicrobial resistance in foals. And he's going to do that from an American perspective. So thank you, Nathan, for joining us from across the pond. We look forward to your presentation. So Nathan, over to you. All right, so antibiotic resistance on farms. We're talking about foals, and we're specifically talking about Rhodococcus equi. So when it comes to Rhodococcus equi, 
you know, what, what's the real, real, you know, revelation in regards to veterinary medicine? Well, we're going to demonstrate that the widespread use of macrolides, especially rifampin, uh, along with rifampin at horse farms, results in a propagation of resistance uh, to macrolides in R. E. Cli, but also resistance to other fecal bacteria to many other antimicrobials. This is something you really don't think of. You start an animal on antimicrobials, you say, yeah, I may get a resistance to a staph that I'm treating or a pseudomonas. But what about the other bacteria in the environment? Hopefully at the end of this lecture, you understand there's much more to obtaining a resistance to the bacteria that you're treating, also the other bacterial in the environment, the so-called innocent bystanders. So rotococcus, why is it important? It affects foals less than six months of age, majority of foals less than three months of age, it's intracellular. You need a virulent associated protein, antigen or, or VAP as we call it, specifically VAP-A for it to become virulent. It's associated with disease in these foals. And it, it resists killing. You're not sure why, there's many different theories out there, but it's associated with the virulence. And therefore these, these organisms can replicate even in the absence of a phagocyme lysosome fusion, it doesn't occur. So these, animals, see, these organisms can proliferate intracellularly, specifically in the macrophages. And you get these pyogranulomatous lesions. Clinical signs in foals, poor weight gain, fevers, low grade cough, sometimes it's vague. Crackles and wheezes you may hear, but it's inconsistent. And it's slowly spread, allowing the foal's ability to compensate for a progression to loss of functioning lung. You know, these animals will start to show clinical signs. You get some extra pulmonary lesions, uveitis. You get some polycinovitis. You'll end up getting some lesions, especially in the pectoral lymph nodes. You'll see them, as you see in this lower picture. You also see it in the mesenteric lymph nodes. 50% of foals at the, at the University of Kentucky Diagnostic Lab back in, 19, in the 80s, 50% of foals that had rhodococcus pneumonia had some sort of intestinal infiltration. Compared, the chance of you having rhodococcus just in the abdomen and no signs of pneumonia is about 4% in central Kentucky at our diagnostic lab. Here's an example of a mesenteric lymph node, abscess uh, of the colon. There you have the ventral colon and the dorsal colon right there, just the mesenteric lymph node, abscess right there. So what do we think of? We think of prevention. When it comes to infectious diseases such as rhodococcus, you think of prevention, control and prevention, that's vaccination. But the problem is it's, it's lacking for our equi. So what do we have? What are our options out there? Hyperimmunized plasma, you give it at birth, you give it 21 days later, it depends what protocols are used. There's different protocols in regards to hyperimmunized plasma, given two liters at birth once or given one liter at birth, and then again, 21 days later to help with you know, the immunity levels for, for these foals. But then there's thoracic screening. Try to find these lesions in the foal's chest before it causes clinical disease. And what I mean is, you know, when if you find a lesion, you tend to treat these animals prophylactically before they get sick. Because some of the screening mechanisms before you did physical appearance, that really isn't diagnostic. Fecal output of rhodococcus equi. I did this back in the early 2000, 2002, 2003 with NOAA, COA, Texas AM. and We collected feces from mares, looked at their foals, any foal that got sick. We even had subclinical pneumonia. We did trantracheal washes. I thought it'd be simple. You take a look at the mares. Whatever mare had a higher number of virulent R equi in the manure, I thought their foals would be more susceptible. So you can use that as a screening to determine what foals may be more susceptible. Well, that was null and void. Fevers, you know, sensitivity, specificity is not the greatest. CBC fibrinogen, you can't really use that so much for the screening. Fibrinogen, definitely not useful. Serum amyloid A, in my hands, and a lot of our colleagues' hands worldwide, try to use serum amyloid A to try to you know, find foals that are be susceptible to rhodococcus equi, or even have a rhodococcus equi is not great. So we tend to use the thoracic ultrasound. You go to the farm, you do screening, you start at one month of age, do it every two weeks, do it every four weeks until they're roughly three months of age, where their immunity will be 
better, so to speak, and decrease chances of maybe getting RE cli, you know, when you're greater than three months of age. That's why we use that sort of cutoff at three months of age. And at that time, on these farms, clinical pneumonia had to be practically eliminated. On the farms that use screening, especially specifically thoracic ultrasound. And I was on the bandwagon. I, I talked lectures all over the country about this thing is the greatest thing since sliced bread. But here comes the big boom. Macrolide rifampin resistance on a breeding farm in Kentucky. So what we're looking at here is really good here. This is where we start, first started screening. 95 poles are born, 30%, 32, 32 30 animals, 32% of the herd was treated. At that time, we sampled every animal that was, had any sort of lesion in the lungs. We did trantracheal washes. None of them had macrolide resistance at that time. Now, we overtreated at this time. You know, if your animal even had a lesion that was even four millimeters by four millimeter region of consolidation in your lung, even less than your pinky nail, we treated. So we didn't know any better. So these are over the years, this farm grew, grew 170, 180 mares. <clears throat> and then it switched ownership. In 2008, another veterinarian uh, came along and they started noticing some resistance. They started noticing 36% of their isolates that they were doing trained trigger washing started becoming resistance in macrolide as well as rifampin. Here's another thing we saw here emergence of resistant macrolides and rifampin in central Kentucky from 1995 to 2017. And this is between all the labs in central Kentucky, our lab, Ruben Riddle, the diagnostic lab. In the early 2000s, there wasn't much resistance, but look at that resistance spike. Why is this? We speculated, and this is one of the risk factors for getting resistance on your farm, is if you do thoracic ultrasound screening, what do we do as vets? If we see a lesion, we're gonna treat, right? Even though they're subclinical, the farm, you got the pressure from the farm. Doc, I don't want any animals sick, doc, I don't want animals die of rotococcus. So we start treating. We start treating them. Uh, we know 99% of these rotococcuses that we see subclinically, I'm saying this tongue in cheek, 99%, are gonna get better on their own. The problem is I can't look at the owner in the eye and go, which one is gonna get better on their own? So we tend to treat them all. And this is when we start getting less specific. We're treating any lesions nowadays, we're not gonna get into it right here, but nowadays it's gonna to have to be a pretty decent size of consolidation, greater than three centimeters plus before we even think about treating. But back then we weren't treating anything. So look at this resistant pattern. So 76% of the farms that we started looking at risk factors emerging rotococcus equi, this is in uh, well, one of the manuscripts we ended up publishing. 76% of the farms had resistance. We looked at 100 farms. And out of those, the 76% that had resistance, they were resistant, 90, 97% of those farms had resistance both the macrolides and rifampin. Now, remember, those were non-virulent as well as virulent R equine. So out of those, 43% of those strains were virulent. They can cause disease. So we started looking at specific farms back in 2018 with uh, Texas A&M, ourselves, University of Georgia. And we found, this is macrolide and rifampin resistant isolates persistent in the environment. We found the soil, flooring, the air, higher in the paddock air than stall air, which I thought, I thought you could find it higher in the stall. So out of that subset of hundred farms, we looked at 10 specific farms that had resistance and found consistently in January, March, May, July, and 54% of the soil and 34% of the air samples also had virulent, you know, rotococcus. So we're gonna see it everywhere. But why were they getting resistance? Well, with some of our research that we were doing with these collaborating with the other universities, they started noticing a gene. An ERM51 gene confirms macrolide resistance to clonal R. E. Cli. So we started noticing macrolide and rifampin resistant isolates increasing in prevalence. We showed you that graph. The isolates persist in the environment. And there's at least two macrolide resistant mechanisms. And now there's even a mechanism in rifampin to date. <clears throat> and a lot of these resistant strains, they seem to be clonal. 
So the kind of resistance strain that we saw in California would be very similar to the same strain that we see in Kentucky. So it's associated with both mobile genetic elements. And I'm sure there's more research out there that's gonna show that maybe some of these aren't clonal, but as of right now in the United States, it's tend to be clonal. Now, it seems like with some of our information we gave out and we started, we saw these increased resistance patterns have come in here and majority of these farms are screening for rotococcus because why? They're getting less sick. A lot of their animals are not clinically ill. They feel like they're growing better. But once we educated them that you could be causing resistance and showed them these graphs and just educated the local community, it seemed like the macrolide and, and rifampin use is decreasing. And we're currently doing a study and crunching the numbers as we speak right now, looking at resistance in the soils. And then, you know, is this really occurring? So macrolide and rifampin treatment alters the microbiota and increases the resistome of macrolides and other antimicrobials. And it increases the resistance of macrolides and other antimicrobials in fecal bacteria relative to controls. We did this in, in Nature Research. We published this information. So if you're looking at, if you put your animal, these are control horses. This is a, a study that we looked at gallium versus the use of, ma of the macrolides. We know if you put a foal on, on pretty much a macrolide, you have decreased fecal shedding of the rotococcus. But look at, but here's the interesting thing. Just look at enterococcus. If you put on a macrolide, you're, you're changed. You don't change in colony forming units of, of enterococcus in the feces. Of course it does, because enterococcus is not susceptible to macrolides. But let me talk about this for a second. So we talk about the full change of enterococcus in feces does not change around the macrolides. But the full change in rifampin resistant among enterococcus increased significantly with a macrolide. That's a macrolide causing resistance to enterococcus to a different kind of antimicrobial, rifampin. So there's a lot of innocent bystander things that can occur when you put an animal on antimicrobials. Here's one we saw that this is uh, an enterococcus uh, or enterococcus as well. And we started looking at animals that were treated with uh, a, a macrolide, excuse me. This is rifamp, this is uh, rotococcus. I'm back to rotococcus now. If you're treated with a macrolide and rifampin, what we notice is pre, this is pre-fecal sample, post-fecal sample of these animals. We start seeing resistance to doxycycline. These animals weren't even on doxycycline. And then these are the percentage of colony forming units of rotococcus. You can see the resistance to doxycycline goes up. So as you have a normal animal in, in the field, you have your microbiota is diverse. You, you consume the, uh, the, the microbes, they flourish in their gut, you defecate it, it's just a circle of life that goes around and around. Add in antimicrobials now. When you add antimicrobials, you're gonna change the microbiota, not only the GI tract, but you can get resistant genes and resistance that occurs. And then these, all of a sudden, these resistant bacteria will be found in the soil and they will proliferate. They will outnumber the non-resistant bacteria but it's not the end of the world. What we've shown, we actually took soil plots, and this is Dr. Roy Huber at Auburn, with our data we had here at Haggard's and our strains we had here, that if you stop these antibiotics, you stop it. One, just because you have a gene for resistance, doesn't mean you have a gene for fitness. You have to give and take. These bacteria have a resistant gene for macrolides or rifampin. If you stop those antibiotic use, they can get outnumbered by the natural strain that is in the soil that is non-resistant because there's something with the fitness gene or fitness of these organisms. When they're resistant, they don't have the fitness gene like these other animals, excuse me, other, animi, uh, other microbes. So over time, you get rid of some of these resistant organisms from your soil once you stop the antimicrobial use. So why is this occurring with rotococcus? We feel like we're over-treating. Yes, a lot of these were spontaneously healed, but which ones? And as we as veterinarians, are we scared? Is that why we, we over-prescribe these antimicrobials? Do we not want to, you know, we don't want to make mistakes. So we feel like, well, well we'll just give, put them on antimicrobials. It won't be any big deal. 
And you never want to go to a farm and hear a uh, your the farm manager go, "Hey, doc, remember that case you saw last week? Well, we found it dead." That's horrible. So you know it's sensitive. We're concerned about the resistant issues, and this is uh, some more food for thought that's out there that we're, we're doing more harm if we're not using the antimicrobials appropriately. Goals to prevent a disaster. But thank you for allowing me to share. Thank you, thank you, Nathan. Apologies, we had a few technical issues at the beginning of that, but thank you for taking the time oh, out of your day. I, um, I know you're in clinics at the moment, so obviously there's a little bit of a time difference. So thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Um, Tim, I don't know if I, uh, Tim, I don't know if I dare ask. Have you got anything else you want to share with us, or uh, did you? No, all, I'm done. I'm not. You're all done. You combined yeah. it all into your first talk. Yeah. Thank you very much. That's great. In which case, let's move on to our last presentation. And I'm delighted that we have another American speaker who's joining us, which is Gillian Perkins. And Gillian is going to talk this time about antimicrobial use, this time in equine respiratory disease from an American perspective. So thank you, Gillian. I'll leave the floor to you. Great. Well, thanks for having me today. I'm so glad to hear about everybody's projects there. And I'm very... Um, jealous and excited for the programs that you guys have set up with this uh, vet team AMR. It really seems like there's going to be a lot of great data collected and and um, and guidance to veterinarians for antimicrobial use. So I think this is going to be pretty lighthearted and easy. I, I, I got to press the right buttons here. Uh, there you go. And I took the approach of talking about this in sort of a case scenario. I find this works best as I'm teaching students um, and then just applying this to kind of the field situation. Um, the other part I just wanted to mention is as a clinician at Cornell, I am both an equine clinician, oh, well, I'm a large animal clinician, so I do serve, um, you know, farm animals as well. And certainly whenever um, rules go into place for use of drugs, it has altered behaviors in the other species. So for sure, years ago when cephalosporins became less used in the bovine species um, and a lot of regulations associated with that, we actually just seem to stop using it so much in the horses as well. So it, these things do have pretty profound impacts and as you guys have been measuring. So when we think about the coughing adult horse, um, I'm often kind of thinking about a variety of things, but you know, I'm talking here today about kind of lower respiratory disease. And a lot of times we're trying to differentiate between allergy and infection. So I tell the students like, really, we're thinking about allergy infection, these adult horses and allergies we know do not require antimicrobial treatment. Certainly, you know, you can see a horse for a viral respiratory disease and high fever, won't go through details on that. But again, we know that treating viral infections with antimicrobials is, you know, not really all that helpful. We do know that sometimes you can end up with a secondary bacterial bronchitis in these cases as, you know, time moves on in the continuum of when they first developed the virus. And so then they kind of can switch over to a bacterial pneumonia, which is, you know, going to be the focus of the rest of this. So we'll get on to that in a second. And for sure, there's fungal agents, but we don't see too many fungal um, pneumonias in our horses. So I won't go through that. So when I'm really taking the history, I'm thinking about what are things that lead me to believe this horse could have, you know, asthma, the allergic disease, or an infection, so mostly viral bacterial diseases. And a lot of it comes down to duration and then also risk factors, because mostly horses are pretty good at not getting pneumonia. Um, but, you know, when we're transporting them long distances and have their heads tied up or they're mingling with other horses, um, and then we have choke scenarios, um, those are scenarios where we see, you know, infectious agents. And certainly um, there are other things on top of that. Um, thinking about environmental um, air quality, for sure, you know, we can have bad air quality for horses with asthma and those with um, infections as well. And I do, you know, understand that sometimes there's a little bit of a difficulty and, you know, we can have gray zone cases, which, you know, we're not sure they're kind of riding the fence. But certainly a lot of times I'm really kind of questioning the clients like, hey, is this horse se seemingly pretty bright, alert, eating, doing well? Or is this a horse that's feeling a bit crappy? It's got a fever. It's not, you know, back in the corner of the stall. Um, not, doesn't quite seem itself. And so that is really a big part of the overall history for me and kind of deciding asthma versus infection. And certainly thinking about other clinical signs, 
you know, I'd say a lot of times people will describe nasal discharge very differently, use words um, cavalierly, I guess. But, you know, if you have that white milky discharge, I'm thinking a lot more about asthma than I am about infectious agent. Although for sure, those profuse serous nasal discharge and the early viral disease, you know, that can be happening, but those horses will have high temperatures. And then of course, mucopurulent and, you know, like this sticky, thick yellow stuff coming from this horse's nose, you know, really think about infection. And then you have odor there too, that's infectious. So a lot of these other things, you know, you guys kind of know these things, but they can help you differentiate between asthma versus infection, um, because it's really going to tailor what we're going to do for our management. So if we get to the end and say, okay, this is an allergy, I'm certainly um, going to kind of try not to be treating that patient with antimicrobials. But if I've gone and decided, okay, this is a sick horse, and I suspect a bacterial bronchopneumonia, we know that there are many agents, most of them are commensal, and most of the time it's a, a streptococcus equi subspecies uh, zoo epidemicus, so strepso. And um, so that's our main culprit, and it's an opportunistic agent. So when we're picking our antimicrobials, we're always thinking about severity of disease, route of administration or compliance from our clients, um, sometimes cost, and then mostly the first line antimicrobial therapy for this, and I'm, my case scenario here is this mild to moderate, you know, case of bacterial bronchitis, a horse that went to a show a week or two ago, and now has just got a, you know, a mild fever and feeling off. And so here you have um, penicillin, cefepifur, and trimethoprim sulfa being kind of the first line approach, which is mostly written up in the textbooks. And so when you look at this list of the who's critically important medications, which you, we saw up on the, on the screen already today, you know, you look at these highest priority ones and the septifur is kind of on that high priority list. And so is um, Enro marbofloxacin. We're not treating our adult horses with macrolide, so we're not really worried about that. But certainly, um, you know, in other, other scenarios where have more severe bacterial bronchitis may be pulling out our penicillins, our um, aminoglycosides, um, some other agents, which are still on a high priority list. So when we think about the septifure, then maybe um, when we go back to our list, we say, okay, maybe we don't want the penicillin or the septifure, um, mostly the penicillin because it's hard for the clients to inject that. And then we get to our trimethoprim sulfa, which we heard today that is very commonly prescribed. And, um, and then using our accurate weight to provide um, a good dosing regimen. So we can treat them with NSAIDs to start, although I don't wanna mask a fever. Um, if our treatment's not working well, you know, it might rest, environmental management, and then having the clients monitor temperature to see how they're doing. And in generally kind of feeling like a 10 day course of therapy, although, you know, that's been kind of written in the textbooks, but, you know, we're unsure the true evidence. Could we go with seven days um, and be okay um, and things like that? So we need to kind of keep working on that. And so there are some studies, uh, but not very many, that are kind of randomized treatment trials. And um, we certainly need more of those. And I think some of this data you guys are collecting might be helpful for all of that. And so this was the um, a suspension of trimethoprim sulfa that's recently been marketed in the US. So when the being treated, we're mostly trying to reduce bacterial numbers, assist the immune response, and then hopefully, you know, the horse will kick in and fix it itself. They don't have to be totally fixed when you stop treating. Um, and then we're going to be monitoring their clinical signs for improvement in their temperature. And certainly if, uh, you know, a horse recently, um, in my world, they've recently shipped from you guys and they've arrived in New York and they're having mild fevers and someone put them on trimethoprim sulfa, you know, and the horse is looking worse the next day and still having fevers, you know, often those are, you know, shipping fever cases. We're very worried about those horses and maybe a, more of a workup, um, a referral potentially, and then thinking about, you know, other antimicrobials and or, you know, your anaerobes that can come into play as well. So I just want to kind of quick mention, you know, where do we want to sample for um, bacterial culture for horses and how do we want to interpret that? 
for sure the trach wash is the um, preferred site for looking at lower airway disease because you know the tracheal puddle is bringing up everything from the lower airways. The nasal swab, um, while it may give you an idea of what's a the normal commensal um, in the horse, it, it may not represent what's in the lower airway. And truthfully, most of the time we're doing BALs for diagnosing asthma and the cell types that are in there. It's, it's not really meant for a culture sample because we're sending it through that upper airway and it can be contaminated. So it's not a sterile uh, procedure. Um, so there's some great work recently looking at deep sequencing of the normal horse in different parts of the airway. And, you know, it's certainly not a sterile environment, lots of bugs there on the mucosal surface. Turns out the pharynx is very similar to the trachea and both proximal and distal. So chances are that pharynx is a source of those opportunistic infections going down the airways, which we, which we knew. And um, so when we're thinking about this, we know that healthy horses can have these bacteria that we get on our cultures. Um, and then we can have sick horses have those on our cultures as well. So then I kind of order or kind of ask the question, if you do not really suspect a bacterial infection, you know, should you um, be doing a culture on this patient? Because what do those results mean to you? And so I would say that if I'm doing a workup on a horse and I really strongly suspect uh, asthma, I'm not necessarily going to do a bacterial culture because I'm not sure how to interpret that result. And I'm going to manage that as an asthma case. So I'm going to say, don't culture and do not give antimicrobials, you know, start on to your educational client of the asthma, the environmental management, a lifelong disease, you know, that rescue meds include bronchodilation and reducing inflammation. So, um, so I guess on top of that, then the trach wash, if we are doing it in our um, cases where we suspect bacterial infection, culture or not, yeah, sure. And, you know, sometimes you're just not sure. You could certainly have this asthma horse that's also got an infection on top of it, too. So, you know, if you're suspecting things and you're kind of on the fence, then, yeah, absolutely. You feel like you can test the horse. Um, and I would recommend also looking at your cytology because your cytology should inform your culture. And so, you know, on the left, we have a horse with asthma, with neutrophils, and I'm not a cytologist, but I know bacteria. And on the right, we certainly have lots of bacteria, um, some of them in uh, pairs, like a strep. And this is a young horse with, um, you know, septic trach wash. So, you know, if I get the non-septic inflammation and I get a positive culture and the rest of the clinical signs support that the horse doesn't seem all that sick, then I'm not going to um, treat it with antimicrobial. So I'm trying to decide, you know, should I use that antimicrobial or not? All right. So there's lots of papers looking at, um, you know, antimicrobial resistance. And it's wonderful that we're kind of documenting these things and learning about antimicrobial resistance. I'm not meaning to kind of um, knock that down at all, but sometimes it's very hard for us to kind of use this in a kind of um, clinical setting as far as your treatment goes. And of course, these cases, you know, are certainly clinical samples, And um, but I'm not sure we still know whether those, um, the veterinarians that were working with the cases really suspected an infection. So they were like, were they like me in my early years where I get a, a respiratory case and we'd always do a culture whether you thought it was, you know, uh, an asthma or not, or is it really um, cases where the clinician strongly suspected an infection? And then um, certainly these would be referral cases for the most part or second opinion cases. So how does this help our first line um, clinicians that are dealing with these cases too? So I, I love, sounds like we guys are going to be collecting this information and we will know more in the future. And I think that um, Dr. Lawson's talk showing the antibiogram um, capability that you have is amazing. Um, and then it's still kind of tricky though to apply that back to that first opinion case. Um, and it is often interesting these papers that there's a lot of decision-making from the bacteriologist as what to do, like what grows on the plate, what they send forward for their MIC determinations. Um, so, you know, it is, it all, it is all a tricky um, diagnostic regimen. <laughs> 
And so, so I think that like this case, you know, we're still warranted to use trimethoprim sulfa, even though sometimes these papers are saying, you know, 50% of the isolates may be resistance, but it may not apply to your primary care scenario. So that's the case that I'm talking about here today is your primary care case. So I think my quick take home message is really do bugs need drugs? If you um, really are suspecting um, asthma, then, you know, I would treat it as asthma and have clients, you can monitor temperature. If it gets worse, then you can switch and add um, antimicrobials to it. It becomes more, more obvious to you. But otherwise, um, not even testing those horses by culture because the results can be um, misleading to you. And then when we're picking our antimicrobials, you know, we need to um, know our spectrum of coverage or compliance and then try to work to avoid these critically important drugs. And then thinking about the diagnostic testing and using cytology to help inform your culture decisions. And I didn't go through prevention, but of course we always need to be preventing these things. So, um, so that's my quick overview. Thanks so much for having me and um, I'll, I'll send it back to you guys. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Gillian. And thank you to all of our speakers. It's really challenging to pack so much information into such a short space of time. We really do appreciate it. Um, we do have some questions, but I'm just going to take one, which is specifically for Nathan, if you're still, still with us, Nathan. And we have only got a few minutes. So I'm not sure if you can answer this in two minutes or not, but I'll read it and you can, you can tell us. It says, could monitoring the resistome of environmental or equi on farm slash geographic regions help improve empirical treatment upon, for example, finding a positive thoracic scan. How could that work? Yeah, I mean, it's something to look into. It, it could work. You know, I'm not a microbiologist, but I know, you know, I, I re rely on the universities to try to grow our eco after the soil. It's not as easy as it sounds, but in the future, I mean, it's something we can look into. And if you start seeing resistant patterns, you know, uh, on the sub in the soil, and you're treating subclinical pneumonia, you may want to put the brake on it in regards to get a little more uh, critical on which foals you treat because you have a lesion one centimeter in size. You know, a lot of these foals we've learned over the years that they can resolve on their own as long as they're not clinical versus one that has a six to eight centimeter consolidation. So I think it's something we could look into, and we are currently looking into. Dr. Laura Huber is at Auburn. And uh, hopefully we can answer some more of those questions once we crunch the data from the last couple of years. Thank you, Nathan. That was beautifully done in just two minutes. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, we could probably chat for, for much longer. It's a shame we've got these fantastic experts with us that we can't take advantage of their knowledge, but we are up to time, everybody. So it just remains for me to thank everybody for your attendance. I hope you found it really useful. Thank you to all our speakers for sharing their wisdom with us. We really appreciate that. Thank you to the wonderful team at RCVS Knowledge for putting this together. It's been really, really great. The short, snappy presentation, I think, have worked really, really well. And please remember, there is a link in the chat to Vet Team a AMR. Please do use that and start to use those fantastic resources that are there um, on the website as well. You will get your feedback form. So please, again, just take a couple of minutes to complete that for you. So with that, I'm going to draw the evening to a close, let you go and enjoy the rest of your evening or our American colleagues the rest of your day. You've still got a whole day's work ahead of you, but thank you very much for joining us and we'll see everybody again soon. So thank you very much, everybody, and good night. Thank you.